Yep, and now we're recording. Again, welcome. Um, so this this uh, lecture and the whole thing is going to start to become a lot more practical. Um, obviously, I said I want everybody, the last two were sort of the, the, the brutal ones. Um, and now we're going to in actually, how can we actually use all this stuff that, you know, we had to painfully we had to painfully listen to. Um, so basically, um, the important is that you do the homework and, and just, you know, at least try it or at least look at the solution so that you see what the ideas are and manifest the ideas. I put a homework two up. Um, it's on the website right now. And the homework one solutions I posted yesterday night. People were asking me, um, can you post them later? So what I did is I put a big like spoiler alert. And first of all, I posted them yesterday night. So, it, you know, there's, there's more time. Uh, we can go through those if you have questions in a bit. Um, but um, uh, in general now, uh, there's going to be a lot of sort of demo and, and GitHub uh, material that I'm going to give you and you can show and you can take a look at. So um, on that note, um, basically what I'm assuming is that by now, especially sort of by the date, October 11th, you have an idea so more and more where it's going like you know uh, how can we sort of estimate memory pool and capacity on all of these different things for an experiment and um, again I put the, the project sort of questionnaire into the piazza and then also um, I uh, 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 you know now that you get from me practical tools that you can actually use um, you'll have a bunch of um, opportunities um, to just try this out first and hopefully get inspired for a project. Also, on, I enabled on Piazza the team search. So um, what I'm hoping people can do is that some people, are, may, some of you may have an idea of what they want to do. And what you do is you say, hey, I want to do X. Um, and then hopefully you find people um, that you can join into a group of people so you can have, um, you know, you don't have to do everything by yourself. Um, and I would like you to do all of that by October 11th. That is in uh, two weeks-ish. Um, and then email those project proposals to me. That's the proposal deadline. I need, definitely need the proposals by that date. Um, and by that date, there's a couple more lectures. You, you saw some practical tools. Um, and then um, uh, I think you, you probably have, I mean, at this point, you should have a good idea about like, Okay, so here's the practical tools. Um, here's some theory. This is what he wants me to do, uh, given, given the, given the uh, project requirements. And on top of that, um, hopefully you can find a team by that. So that's sort of the, the work that's coming up right now uh, for you guys. Um, and so, so I'm hoping um, this can be done. Um, I also noticed that we have a couple of people drop out of the lectures. I was kind of expecting that because um, we have lectures, they're all online. And some of you joined from China or from different um, regions that were more difficult to, to stay up. So uh, very important for me is the, the major port of communication is Piazza. So that obviously doesn't have to be real time. If people are at you know, the end of the world, that's what, what happens right now, right? Quarantine, uh, COVID pandemic uh, is no fun, okay. Um, in the end though, please email project proposals to me. And now project proposals doesn't mean a 15 pager for the National Science Foundation. Project proposals really just means like a, a, a paragraph or two of like, okay, I'm planning to do X. And what I'll do is I will comment on all of them. Okay, so I will basically give you feedback on what I think this is, you know, what you should concentrate on or something like this. Okay, so please email those to me. Um, any questions about projects right now? Anything cool? Oh, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, it seems like the project um, is, I guess, I guess the, the project kind of is formulated for supervised machine learning uh, problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are your suggestions if uh, we plan to use, for example, ongoing reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning uh, problem and want to investigate the um, 
machine learning approaches are used in that project? Yeah, so um, for this class, um, we really don't do unsupervised uh, machine learning because I mean, I don't teach anything about it. Now, reinforcement learning is not unsupervised, um, right? So because you do have a reinforcement, you have the function, right? That says, go there, go this, do that, go this. Um, and that makes it basically classification. Um, uh, we have had a lot of, in fact, a lot of reinforcement learning projects before that uh, um, that went better through this. Um, yeah, and also now that you say this, um, I am asking Rishi. Rishi Puri is one of the first students of this class, and he also was a TA last uh, time I taught the class when we will still be able to have a TA. And he actually did a reinforcement learning project within the scope of this class, and in fact, a pretty good one. He ended up getting an A plus in, in uh, I think, Sergey Levine's reinforcement learning class, and he also ended up an A plus in my class. So, um, so I would say two things: um, maybe hold on a little bit and and understand um, a little more than you probably will see that there's a direct connection. And the second thing is, um, I will try to get his project. So I can, um, I can send it to all of you as an example of a project. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Professor. Yeah. And then, by the way, if you have very concrete questions about, oh, how does your stuff fit to my stuff? Um, like really like individual questions, um, please come to the office hours. That was office hours of four. Office hours are Monday, one to two, okay? So that's, that's also very important. I want to reinforce office hours because a couple of people showed up, but um, I think um, a lot of this sort of, you know, sort of this was the high level theory knowledge and, and now we get more concrete. And then later on you ask yourself, how do we do this for my project? And I know you will need help. So, and especially because you can collaborate so easily with other students, definitely please come to the office hours, okay? Um, there is another question, and I'm trying frantically to get my mouse cursor over it. Um, huh. This is kind of weird. Um, give me a sec. Uh, okay. Check. Here we go. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. That makes sense. Uh, no more question. Good. So that's the homework. So uh, did any, let's discuss the homework quickly. Um, the homework, so let's go there. That is, this is homework two, uh, which is already on the web. And then I'm gonna open for you homework one. Okay, so um, the first question, can everybody see this, right? Okay, so the first question was, draw a box and arrow typical workflow of a machine learning experiment. In training and testing. And so I say here, see course website, because what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a typical workflow for kind of different experiments on my slides, okay? So first of all, if you look into my book and my media book, then this is what, what's presented there, right? So this is the generic project workflow for accuracy. Um, where you basically um, have to do machine learning on some development data. And the development data has uh, usually a validation set and a training set. Um, and the trick is that you train on the training set and then you, you, you measure accuracy on the validation set. This is sort of the, the trick to, to say, hey, we're generalizing. Um, we will discuss what the problems with this is. Uh, there's a bunch of issues. Um, but this is sort of the standard approach right now. And so then we have um, basically in order to do that, you do ground truth. And of course, the idea is that you have test data. And the test data is later on sort of somebody else tests it. And, and applies those models and gets results and then evaluates independently, sort of not that not only the validation set, uh, you know, was right, but also 
that if I take data that's completely, you know, not part of the learning process, I can still predict something right, right? So that is the typical uh, workflow of a machine learning experiment. And um, yeah, that's basically um, the idea here that, that you can go ahead and uh, uh, do it the easy way. Now, we are now with more and more machine learning, we get into other realms. So for example, um, there's this DARPA XAI project and what they proposed at some point was we should extend this, right? So you see my original graph here is like the two, the two green ones and then the red one are still there, but there's extra stuff like the purple stuff. And the purple stuff is now we actually realize we may have to work on debugging. We have to have some kind of accountability. We have to, uh, well, we have to fine tune. We wonder if there's an introspection, like we say, okay, so this particular um, example during training has not been learned or during validation has not been classified right. Um, why? Right? What are the parameters that we have to change such that it works and what does it destroy, right? So that's basically the idea of, of sort of the, the XAI ideas with explainable AI and then also the hope is that as you get a model that model you can look at it and it gives you a lot more uh, information maybe not looking at it in terms of look look at it but basically you could have a debugger or some kind of tool that looks at it and says ha huh, these are some of the boundaries of the model and as you can see all of this is not very well defined um, because again it's a darker project and they wanted to do research um, but um, in terms of your homework, that obviously would be a quite elaborate, uh, you know, solution to your homework. But if you want to go one further, I can give you more elaborate solution to your homework, um, which is even more um, sort of detailed. Um, so you'll see that if you actually want to generalize um, more, then you, you could start you know, looking at capacity and you could looking at um, estimating capacity, finding out which machine learning use and so on and so forth. And that's, that's basically, we're getting too closer and closer and closer to something that's a real engineering approach to machine learning where you actually go and say, okay, so first of all, let's check our, check our truth, right? So our truth is we have people annotating some data, but how good are they, right? So the first step on the, on the very left here is to actually say, okay, let's, let's check. If three independent people annotated the data, would they come to the same result? And maybe let's only take the data where three come to the same result or two come to the same result, right? That's called annotator agreement. And if the annotator agreement is high enough, then you can start doing something. If it's too low, um, you have to clean the data, uh, definitely, because if humans can do it, you can't get good labels, then you kind of host. Um, but even if everything looks fine, maybe your classes are super imbalanced, right? Now you have another problem. So um, you have to probably annotate more of the class that you're missing. And that's actually the best approach. The only other approach, but I don't recommend it either. Uh, the only other approach is to subsample the majority class to balance the classes. But the bigger problem is here, if you do that, you lose information, right? From the majority class too. And any way you subsample, you introduce bias, okay? Um, definitely do not super sample because that is totally biased. The only way to super sample right, like the minority class, is to have a model of your data. And guess what? You don't, that's why you do the whole exercise, right? And so that's a catch 22. Um, and then, you know, I don't want to go too much into details here, but in this homework, I basically mostly ask you to like really think through all the steps because I think lots of the machine learning community, they only focus on, oh, how do I train AlexNet, right? Boom. It's not the point. The point is, this is a whole flow. It starts from, from collecting the data and making sure the labels are right, making sure the labels are balanced, making sure we have enough data and so on and so forth. And so here's a, uh, here's another alternative workflow.
um, yeah, um, so that would be for for that for that one uh, A, um, and of course in one B uh, is where can you add quality controls? I mean, I gave you a couple uh, just with a bigger graph, which is like for example, um, an annotator agreement is a quality control, um, but it could also be uh, debugging of implementation using well-defined functions. For example, what it means is that you create synthetic data that you know the answer for. And you want, obviously, after you train the model, that the machine learner uh, absolutely gets it right, OK? So if you create synthetic data um, and it doesn't get it right, then you have a problem. Um, and then also cheating experiments, right? So let's say um, you have a held out set or something. And what if you just use that to train? So what if you don't validate, right? So what you do is use every all the data you have or, or most that you have without a training uh, validation split and then obviously the question is what's the accuracy you can get because if you can get high accuracy then you should get 100 percent right on on the same thing right so you train with with training and validation set together and then you validate with the validation set then you need to get 100 percent um because if you don't then something is also very interesting there um and then you could measure generalization um, which is what we're going to introduce in this lecture and the next lecture. And then you can also measure user experience. Um, so, you know, I can come up with all these mathematical things, um, but really in the end, if you're in, in a company, uh, what counts is the user experience. What counts is that the user says, oh yeah, this predictor works, I trust it. And, and that's actually work. Um, um, it, it's work okay? So, any questions about number one? Because number one was obviously the sort of soft and, and the one with the most amount of work. Um, any questions? Uh, professor? Yeah. So, um, how do you know if you generate, if you use synthetic data to train your model, how do you know if the synthetic data um, represent the distribution of the real data that you know, your model will be using? Well, the, the, your model will be deployed on eventually? Well, I mean, that really depends on your data, right? So for example, when we did speech recognition, right? Um, you could have speakers uh, do speech recognition and then what you can do is you can use a synthesizer to synthesize speech and put that into the speech recognizer. And the speech, you, you, by well-trained speech recognizers, will do amazingly well on synthesized data. Okay, and I have no problem uh, recognizing synthesized data because it's so much less noisy and just works. So that's an example. I see. Right? Thanks. Um, but you could also render a cat and render a dog and see what happens, to be frank. I mean, you will, all, all things that can happen is you can just learn, right? <laughs> um, I mean, there's different ways of doing this. So I would not train on the synthesized data. I would use the synthesized data to test because you can now, for example, take that um, take the speech that you generated and add noise to it and see, well, if I add noise in this direction, if I add pitch, if I make it too loud or too too uh, uh, too silent, when does the, the recognizer stop doing things? Right. So you test out the limits using using synthesized data. Okay. Thanks. So uh, there are other questions. I'm going to go try quickly through the next ones because most of you should know this stuff. And if not, um, uh, 61C basically drills this in. So um, one thing to also look at is the Patterson Hennessy book um, that really also explains it. So how many bits do you need to encode an integer 126? Well, what you have to do is you have to take the log of 126, which is six point something. And of course, we know it's very hard to model anything with sort of half a bit. So since it's six point something, you take the ceiling and it becomes seven bits. So log two of 126 is six point something, then you need to take the ceiling because half bits don't exist. Um, so it's seven bits. Um, how many bits do you need to encode 32.56? Okay. So that's interesting too, theoretically. You only need log 2, 32.56 or 5.02 bits, which would be six bits. But you also, that doesn't really work because 
because um, you have to sort of represent the floating point, right? In reality, uh, if you want two digits, it would be log two of 3,256 plus somehow encoding where the point goes, right? Um, and so what we do technically is we say, let's take 32 bits or 64 bits, and then we do floating point representation. Um, and, you know, again, let's explain the present Hennessy. Um, so now you have, you assume you have two positive integers of size and bits each. How many bits does the result of addition, subtraction, multiplication of the two numbers maximum generate? And that's actually a thing that we should keep in mind. So think about it. You have, let's say you have two numbers, right? Uh, 128 and 128. If you add 128 plus 128, so these would be the two highest, or 127. If the 127 plus 1, the two highest seven bit numbers, um, what's the result of that? Well, 254. And that is obviously an eight bit number, right? So the maximum, um, if you have two numbers of n bits, right? The maximum you can do with addition is double it, right? If the n bits are all one, and then basically you add these two numbers, you get twice the original number. And so that means exactly that it's n plus one bits, right? So because you, with another bit, you can represent double uh, the magnitude of number, right? Now, subtraction is interesting because subtraction is if you have, if you have um, uh, some number uh, with n bits, well, even then, if you subtract it, um, the maximum size could be just subtracting by one, right? And so that means you end up staying at n bits. Um, multiplication is interesting. What you say is, well, um, we set n to log 2n, right? And then obviously um, n is our original number, the big n. So um, now we know that if we took two big 2n's, you would multiply them together. And that turns out to be in the end 2n, so too small n. Why? Well, because again, um, if, you, if you take the number of bits of a number that you multiply, then the logarithm will multiply, and then it's n plus n is 2n. Okay? Um, and that's uh, very important. So when you multiply numbers, you double the bit range. And when you add numbers, you only add one, okay, maximum. And we only mean that, you know, when we talk about collusional layers and stuff. So assume you have an 8 bit, 8, eight times 8 matrix of 8 bit numbers. You now select the maximum number, right? A, or you calculate the average of that matrix. How many bits do you need to store the large in each case? And it turns out, well, the maximum number is only 8 bits, because guess what? We said it's a matrix of 8 bits. So, you know, you, you will see, you see already how this goes to convolutional uh, networks sooner, right? And then also eight bits for the average. Why? Well, because in theory, it could be that all the numbers are maximal, right? So you have all of them using the full eight bit range. Well, then the average is still eight bit, right? Um, interesting enough, how many binary matrices of eight times eight are there in total? right? And that is 2 times 8 times 8, or 2 to the 64, which is a huge number. Okay. Um, but you can get that number. While it's a huge number, it's, you know, the 2 to the power of n notation is pretty cool, right? Um, so 2 to the power of 400, again, is something like 10, 10 to the power of 120. Um, but also two to the power of 2000 or something. I mean, if you put that into a Google calculator, it's gonna tell you it's infinity, um, but reality is no, it's just a huge, huge, huge number, okay? Um, oh, so that was a question that I oversaw. So somebody asked, I think in reference to, uh, so Darren asked in reference to a 2B, is that I triple E double 64? And the answer is yes. Um, Quick answer, yes. Um, there are other ways of doing it too, but the IEEE standard, standardized it, and that's a good thing. By the way, I heard lately that NVIDIA started to do their own floating point representations again. 
I don't con I, I don't I'm, I think that's a good idea um, but of course Nvidia doesn't have to listen to me so they do what they want but it was a long long struggle to get floating point numbers normalized in all computers sort of in the 90s and 2000s and so finally you know you can take one program and run it on another machine without any hassle but uh, if you start, if you start doing NVIDIA CUDA graphic cards have different floating point numbers. It's going to be a nightmare, I think. But it's their decision, not mine. So information content. You have a black image with a resolution of 64 to 16 bytes. It's the minimum, maximum information content in that image. Um, and how do you image an AMD look like? Well, it's pretty clear. The minimum information content is when you have all zeros, right? It's basically black, the no image, it's, it's not there. Um, and the maximum information is for uh, 4096 bit. And this is when each pixel has independently a probability of 0.5 to be black or white. And we already looked at this, the noisy image has the most uncertainty, right? You cannot compress anything out of that, right? Um, and the image in A obviously is all white and the image in B is random noise. Um, Actually, it's all black, but you could also do all white. It doesn't matter. It's one color, right? It could be encoded as, you know, uh, 60 times times 64 times that color. It's super small encoded. So now, this is a typical exercise, the next one, number four, that I like to um, give to people mostly because um, um, it's something you can't actually do with math. I mean, you can, but the real point is to simulate it in your head. And I will give you more of this. So for example, suppose you have five pairs of socks in a drawer. How many socks do you have to minimally pick to guarantee that at least one pair is chosen, right? So six socks guarantee one pair. Why? Well, because when you have 10 socks, they're all of different colors. Obviously, after you picked five, you know that now the next one needs to match, right? Because you do pick all colors. Now, the interesting part is that is a guarantee. Before that, it's statistical. You could be lucky and just pick two and are done, right? If they're randomly shuffled, you know, there's a probability that you pick two socks and you're done. Now, do you have to take 10 socks? No, absolutely not. If you just one pair, six socks are fine. And of course, you know where this exercise comes from, right? This exercise comes from the fact that if you want to guarantee that a neural network can absolutely model something, just pick enough parameters, and that's the analog to six. But you may be fine with less parameters, that's the statistical point, right? So, um, especially when you do SGD. But the, the trick here is the, the idea that you also, you can think of sort of the statistical probabilities but then if you, if you pick enough socks, you don't have to think about those anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, same with uh, 15 red balls, 15 green balls with an integer between one and 100. Um, no integer appears on one more ball. And so the value of a pair of balls is the sum of the number of balls. Show there at least two pairs consisting of one red and one green ball with the same value. Show that this is not necessarily true if there are certain balls of each color. That is actually a famous exercise. I think it was done by one of our theoretical scientists here in Berkeley. And the interesting part about this exercise is that it has to do exactly with the, um, with the thing about thinking about bottlenecks, okay? There's so many numbers here, 15 red balls, 15 green balls, sum of integers, and so on. But really all you have to think about is each ball has a different number right? And assuming no two pairs of the same value, right? Um, then there are 15 times 15 different sums. And um, looking at the numbers 1, 300, the highest sum is 199 and the lowest is 3. And it gives you 197 possible sums. And since 255 is greater than 197, there must be two pairs with the same color. Right. So it's the same idea like with the socks. Um, and again, it's nothing to do with probability. It has only to do with counting. Um, and it's, it's sort of simulate this in your head kind of uh, idea. Um, there's no need to go to probabilities or any of this. It's just really just thinking and counting. 
And of course, now we do the same idea with 13. And it turns out, well, 13 times 13 is 169. And 169 is smaller than 197. So there's not necessarily two pairs with the same sign. Okay. And um, uh, for these kind of exercises, and you will see later also for, for sort of video neural networks, very good to just keep in mind, don't think too complicated. Just ask yourself, okay, what is the count here? What is the bottom? Okay. So then very relevant to the end is the estimate the memory requirement to implement a 20 questions game in a self-contained device. Guess what? This has been done and using neural networks, by the way. This is a 20 questions game. Um, this guy got quite famous and rich. So just knowing how to dimension a neural network can get you So the original game was implemented using neural network trend and input. For this exercise, you can assume a decision tree. You can also, at this point, you don't have work because you know the memory filling capacity, right? So the naive approach is you assume that each question is a string of 20 characters, each character is a bit. There's a maximum of two to the power of 20 possible questions since they all yes, no questions, right? And that gives us two to the power of 21 possible answers, right? So we assume that each response has a maximum of 10 characters. The memory used for this would be really just math, something like uh, uh, 16, 167 million bits, which is a total of 20 megabytes. And that's of the very possible today. Uh, when the game came out, it seemed impossible. Having said that, the, the tree was heavily pruned. That's why they used neural networks to basically uh, train and prune the tree. Um, now that there's a domain informed approach, which is saying, huh, now if I just take, so how do I prune the tree, right? But if I have some knowledge, like a domain knowledge, then I look for the bottleneck and I figure out there's only about 4,000 everyday concepts, right? And since there's only 4,000 everyday concepts, um, then the tree would only be 12 bits or 12 years, no questions per concept. And that gives the memory requirement of only 80 kilobytes. And that's the funny thing here. They were accelerating how many questions actually need to be asked. Because in reality, um, it's well known that most people in their heads only know about 4,000 concepts. And maybe you know 10,000 concepts if you're really educated. But guess what? That's just one bit more, right? That's like maybe 13 bits or, four, or maybe, uh, maybe 14 bits, OK? But it's not 20 bits, um, which is a lot more. And that makes it highly, highly implementable in a small device. Okay, so that is uh, number six is um, a real-world example of experimental design for neural networks. Um, now the trick is now that you know that you only need um, twelve years more questions, and sort of this memory requirement, but mostly governed by the strings. You can now say, okay, let's do a model that's using you know the tools that we have to in memory. For but again, not for this homework, for this homework, all I wanted you to do is basically think about the approach you would take to do the sort of the experimental design of this particular experiment. Any questions? If there are no questions, then I'm gonna give you some demo today. Um, this is the demo. Um, as some people looked at this, um, so this is our TF meter. Um, I'm going to just uh, show you TF meter. This has been uh, designed um, after something called the TensorFlow Playground from Stanford University. And my students over the semesters have started to basically take this thing and add measurements to it. And then for fun, we said, so the original playground says, uh, go ahead, play with a neural network, you can't break anything. And then we were like, our answer to that, our Berkeley answer to the Stanford approach was stop tinkering, start measuring. Uh, let's, let's actually do this for real, right? Predictable experimental design of neural networks. So, um, so what you have here, let's start very simple, is it, when you press the play button, it'll actually go ahead, take the network that's defined in the middle, and then, you know, create a boundary um, and visualize the boundary of, of what it says. So here on the right, you see a data set. And um, uh, here in the middle is the input layer with possible features. 
Um, and this is the hidden layer that you can actually manipulate. And then there's an output layer in the end, obviously, that uh, you don't see, but it exists. So the interesting part here is obviously that's a very simple problem. Um, in fact, it's so simple, I could even completely get rid of the hidden layer. We can just do this, right? Um, and now we have, uh, we have that. So next question. So what happens if, um, so this is that, what happens if um, I go and, and take something more complicated, right? Because that's the whole point. Now, if I take something more complicated, like this is like a circle, then with three bits of capacity, we should not expect this to work because if you try this, it turns out, yeah, I mean, the three bits of capacity, as we all know, we pretty much can only guarantee to model three of those points, <laughs> right? Now, this is a specific structure though. Maybe we could, but really the three bits of capacity, that's basically one neuron. You have one linear separation. So, uh, and one linear separation in, in, in three dimensions, but the, the point is we only have two dimensions, but it's just not enough. So the question is now, how much do we need for this structure, right? And so the intuition here is this, you need one separation, two separation, three separation, four separation, five, six, it's kind of like a stop sign, right? Looks like a stop sign. So think about the edges of a stop sign there will be six separations, but in two dimensions. So six separations in two dimensions will be 12 bits. And guess what? There is something that tells you that. <laughs> okay, so we actually estimate the capacity demand for the structure, it's 12 bits. So let's try it. So as we add a hidden layer, this is eight bits. So let's try eight bits. Yeah, we see you can do a stop sign with this. Um, I'm going to switch it from sigmoid to real though. So it's a sharper edge. And you see, yeah, it tries to kind of do the stop sign, but it really doesn't get there. So you need more capacity. So you add another 11 bits that could maybe work. Let's see. Yeah, almost. Yeah, okay, we did it. Okay. So that's the point. So now why did 11 bits work? Well, because one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So again, we know from the K that the memory pooling capacity guarantees, um, but obviously we have some generalization that goes beyond. So yeah, 11 bits did it. So um, that is sort of the engineering approach here. You can go and estimate what is the capacity need for a particular data set and then build the network accordingly. And I, I want you to play around with this by yourself, by the way, all of the typical stuff like uh, learning rate, um, uh, the different, different activation functions, regularizations, regularization factor, all of this stuff uh, you can play around with. You can also edit the signal strength, right? So if you add noise, um, you know, this gets a lot harder, right? This is not going to be uh, anymore. Um, and then um, you can even work with batch sizes and stuff, right? Um, that probably, yeah, look, the, the larger batch size is converges faster. Um, can you regenerate the whole thing? Try again, um, right? Uh, you can discretize the output. Um, looks like this thing or and you show the test data which is used for its validation data actually shows validation data right? um, and also the confusion matrix is shown here and if you if you click on any of those you see exactly what this means okay and even the algorithm of how we generate uh, the different things um, we also give you a bias indicator which basically shows you uh, the classifier prefers a certain class or not um, again, that's kind of a little bit your homework to play around with this, but it should give you a better intuition for memory equivalent capacity. And I think the most interesting thing will be for you to try to model this structure um, because the capacity demand is actually not so high. 
um, is 14 bits, while well, 11 doesn't work, but you will need uh, 14 bits more like deep layers, and certainly it's not so high. Uh, you probably do something like this, right? Um, and then you start doing, and you still feel like, ah, what, why doesn't it work, why doesn't it work? It slowly bends itself in there, so then you have to do, you decrease the learning rate, and yeah, then you see, ah, slowly, 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 right? So just because you know capacity doesn't mean everything is easy, right? It just means we have sort of the right amount of neurons. Right? And also, um, something else that may be interesting for you guys is, if you look at this neural network, right, let's actually kill some neurons here. The, this, this memory curling capacity calculation that you see here um, is actually totally, totally um, exactly what I showed you last semester. And, uh, sorry, last lecture. And the major point is that if I, if I add neurons, right, um, it doesn't do anything because all of these neurons, all this memory here is dependent on these three, right? So adding neurons doesn't do anything. Now you may say, okay, that's what your math said, but can we see that? Well, yeah, let's do it. So let's really get rid of neurons. And then what we see is as we try to train, actually I should give it a uh, higher, as we try to train, um, we see two types of neurons, right? So the, the, either they're mirroring this one, right? They can only see the information of this neuron. So that's why you see all the information is just mirrored by this neuron, right? Or they do nothing, right? They can be zero, right? They can basically be non-neutralized. Um, and that's exactly one bit, by the way, again. Right? So this is one bit of information. I do nothing or I have this, but they cannot do anything with this information because it completely depends on that neuron. If you take two, you'll see that's kind of interesting. You see kind of four states. You see that you basically have a copy of those. And then you usually also have the combination. I gotta, I gotta probably restart this. Um, right, so if you go add a couple more. Um, Right, so maybe you do this structure because it's easier. Right, so now we do this. Yeah, okay, now we see it. So you see that in the end, it's either zero, which is one state, or it's the combination of like the two, or it could be, right? So that's the second state, or it could be a copy of one or the other one, which would be two more states. You only get to four states, which is completely explained because we only have two bits of output here and two to the power of two is four. Um, and if I run this longer, we'll probably see all four states. So the entire layer here, the entire layer of 10 neurons, you will only see four states because again, these are completely dependent on the output of the previous one. Right. But again, I, I want you to sort of play around with this and understand um, this by yourself in the context of what we're doing. And it's very good, I think, to go back to this app. First of all, it's fun to play with, at least I found it fun. And second, to just construct certain things and figure out what happens and see how these rules that are so sort of, you know, rule one, two, three, four um, actually work. I mean, they, they're just basically very practical rules that just do its thing. Any questions about this one? Right, let me show you one more thing then, which is if we add a bunch of hidden layers, right? And you make them symmetric. Oh my God, it's too many anyway. Okay, now we're bunch of layers. 
So what you'll see is it's getting very hard to train this thing, okay? Because really, I think the solution is here. First of all, the, the capacity we require for, for this is not high. But the last layer here is completely empty, right? Nothing happens. And also this layer is, is already kind of bad because it's just full, full, full. So what happened there? What happens there is the data processing inequality as you have dependencies over dependencies. Of it. So this first layer only sees five bits. And then even though they all see five bits, as you go through the layer, you lose information, you lose information, you lose information because it's all thresholding, 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 thresholding. And then in the end, no information gets to the last layer. This is why Microsoft was complaining that for some reason, we cannot train deep neural networks larger than 12 layers or something. Well, yeah, because you lose all the information on the, on, on the side. And unless you do like convolutional layers or something, a, a, a regular like a multi-layer perceptron, we just lose all the information on, that's the whole trick, right? So you can't stack too deep, um, despite the fact that everybody likes to say the word deep. Um, also something to try out. Okay, um, again, there are no questions. We will start with the content of the lecture, um, but uh, we will not finish today because it's a lot of stuff, but that's okay because um, it's very important for me that we also discuss the homework and that you see some practical, uh, see some practical stuff. So any, any other question? Okay. Then let's move on to lectures. So the conclusion so far, okay, is that the lower limit of generalization is memorization. This is the upper limit for the size of a machine learner is its memory capacity, okay? And the measure capacity is measurable in bits like we do with any memory, okay? Um, now using a machine learner that is over capacity is a waste of resources and increases the risk of failure. Now with that part, I gave you just like this, but I know that there's a bunch of literature, for example, the MIT, um, is an MIT paper um, that, um, um, there's an MIT paper that says, no, 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 we want to overparameterize. it's easier to learn, right? And we discussed this yes, uh, last time too. Now, alchemy converted into chemistry by measuring, it's time to bring that guessing and check into machine learning, into science, let's call it data science. That's what I said last time. Now, again, while the proof for three, I still owe, okay, and I, I will get there. For now, I keep it as a conclusion as, hey, the professor said so, okay? But I understand that's not the right way to go, we will work on this, okay? But um, as we work on this, uh, it's important that sort of, you'll see that this is the, at least for now an underlying a, a, an assumption, okay? It's the underlying assumption. Before we go into further to see that this assumption is very, 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 very likely correct, okay? Okay, now, everything I said here so far, by the way, was for non, uh, sorry, for balanced, not not, yeah, so for balanced binary classifiers, right? Uh, and no regression. So what we don't have is non-balanced non-binary classifiers and we don't have regression. We haven't talked about convolutional networks. We haven't even classed, talked about multi-class, right? We haven't talked about other machine learning except decision trees. And we need to rethink training. And in some way, we want to also talk about the Zell examples because they are a very important part of the generalization problem, right? So we will go to non-balanced, non-binary, and so on later at a later point. Uh, we will also go to convolutional networks at a later point. For now, the next thing is we will rethink training a little bit, and we will also rethink um, sort of, you have some data, how do we actually get to the capacity? Because what I gave you right now so far was you have a network, give me the capacity, but that doesn't help you if you don't know um, what the capacity of the data should be. And of course we have the trivial thing where it's like, okay, if you're binary balanced, then each row in your table is one bit. And that means that your memory equivalent capacity of the neural network should maximally be 
the number of rows in your table or the number of instances of the balanced binary classification problem. We said that so far, but what I want to do now is I want to go deeper and give you a much, much better estimate for neural networks. So the question here is how do we predict capacity requirement, right? Or in other words, how does this algorithm that I showed you in the demo actually work? Um, and the theoretical answer in any way is what is the minimum description length of the table representing the function f? That would be the Shannon entropy of the function. Okay, that's important. It's not the Shannon entropy of the, um, of the data, right? It's not that you zip the table. What it is, is it's, it's the number of arrows Right, as I said before, arrows in the finite state machine that's actually implied by your table needs to be compressed, right? Um, and now I'll give you a practical answer. The worst case is to build a network where only the biases are trained. And the expected case is, well, how much parameter reduction can training then bias, okay? And you have to do this a little bit on the whiteboard next. So this is the algorithm, but I want to explain this to you using uh, the whiteboard because it's, it's uh, it also will help with your homework, by the way, because it's a very interesting um, concept that people probably um, need, need, to, need to be uh, get used to. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to my InSpace application um, into light mode and press the tab, right. um, here we go. So now we in like mode. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this way, I'm going to share a different way, which is this way. Okay, everybody can see this, right? So, white, whiteboard. So let's go again and think about what it means when I say we compress the function, not the table, okay? So let's compress a function, right? So remember we had this problem. This problem was that we have one neuron, x1, x2, right? And the bias. And, and uh, we, we say x1 and x2 are basically just binary variables, right? And the question was for Minsky, uh, so the, the Minsky problem was, um, can we do all 14 functions? Right? Can we do all 16 functions? And it turns out XOR uh, and not XOR don't work. Right? So now, instead of giving you the quantitative idea that we got from that K with the T and K function, I will give you the actual practical idea of why that something like M works and something like X or doesn't. So let's take a look at the truth table, okay? So X1 and X2 will be all variables. And so the truth table um, just looks like this. Um, right, that's, maybe let's do N. N we know is implementable, right? So N will be this one, right? So if we have a truth table, we got zero, 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 one, one zero and one one, right? So 61 C says hi, right? Now end looks tall, zero, 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 one. Well, good job. Um, so why can we compress end? Could we compress end? Well, the trick here is to build the finite state automaton that, that this end thing represents, okay? So if you think about it this way, it looks like at first glance, like our automaton is zero, zero to zero, zero, one to zero, zero, one to zero, uh, one, zero to zero, and one, one to one. But if we actually take a closer look, then we see that, for example, if we fix X1, right? If you only look at X1, then if X1 is zero, then we can actually skip right over x2 because if x1 is zero, it doesn't matter what x2 is. 
And we already know this all from Python. This is called lazy evaluation, right? If your first variable is false in an end function, you don't have to take a look at the second variable. And so, yeah, when we build the finite state automaton, you can now say, well, x1 equals equals zero gives you zero right away, okay? And you stop. And then uh, x1, x2 equals equals um, sort of one zero. Well, then the second arrow and stop is is also zero. And then obviously x1 comma x2 equals equals one one uh, ends up being one. Okay. So now we reduced four arrows, four state transitions in our function to three. And that's why we can do that in a perceptron. Now, before we conclude that, let's take a look at XOR, right? So we take a look at XOR, which is the same kind of thing again. We just do XOR. Um, XOR. So then a zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Now, when we take a look at XOR, we see that uh, this should be zero, one, one, zero. And you will find out there's just no way you can compress these four arrows that you need here, these four state transitions into three or less. And because we can only have three state transitions modeled in a, in a single perceptron of two inputs, we can mark do x or, okay? Questions so far? Now, the bigger question is, I give you a table and you tell me how to, um, I'm gonna actually, uh, to library. I'm going to start a new life mode. Okay? So now the question is, the, 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 the thing you want to solve is, you give me some data and I tell you how compressible is the data without training a network. Okay? So let's do that. Um, life mode. Tab. Okay, so let's do that for X, or and end. So here is what I propose to do. So, okay, first of all, what is the learning problem? The learning problem is, again, we have weight one, we have weight two, and we have a bias, right? And the learning problem is, the learning problem is, what's weight one, what's weight two, and what's the bias, right? If I give you the, the, the table for end, how do you get to weight one, weight two, and the bias? It's a question, right? So I, I can give you and say, okay, um, this is my end table. So x1, x2, and end, and we fill this out one more time. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and this is 0, 0, 0, 1, okay? Now, how do you get from this table to those weights? Now, your answer should be, we take Minsky's perceptron learning, right? So Minsky created a, a perceptron learning algorithm that you use to, to, to teach a perceptron whatever you want to teach it, and it tunes the weights, and it guarantees to converge. There's no stochasticity in it, it just works, okay? It can take a long time to converge for a difficult function, and unfortunately, it only converges when your problem is linearly separable. What it means is that it doesn't converge for X or it will train forever. And Minsky was really, really, really uh, angry about that. Minsky unfortunately did not know the theory that I just gave you, which is like, oh, three state transitions. So yeah, of course we can do it. Minsky had a different angular edit and, and became really, really angry at neurons that they can do X or not. Okay, so, but what I want you to do is now, what if you didn't have perceptual learning, okay? And now I'm saying the following. Well, the problem is this, we have three unknowns, right? We really have three unknowns. Three unknowns is a lot. Now it is solvable still here, but because you could just do linear algebra. But if you have three unknowns, 
And especially when you go and, and do a real neural network, you end up having hundreds of thousands of unknowns. And then doing linear algebra on that may or may not work out. It's just really difficult. And also we said we don't want to train. We want to actually measure the complexity before training. So how would we do this? And here's what I propose. We set the WI to one. We basically say, we don't care about the weights. We set them to one, right? And then our learning problem, which, which was originally that you have these XI, WI greater than a B, becomes now that the XI are greater than a B, right? And that's interesting. Um, so what you can do then is you just say, okay, uh, let's just do this. This is just the sum of the XI, right? So let's put the sum of the XI in here, which is zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus zero is one. And one plus one is two. And now guess what? Here is a perceptron training right there. So you know that the threshold must be here, right? Because this is the class change in the end. So I just trained the threshold. I just trained a new one for you, which is the weights are one. And your threshold is one, two. And that will be n. You can try that at home. So now, does this always work? No, it doesn't. But the trick here is what would happen when you do this for x or for example, right? So let's do it for x or. Um, you, could, you could probably do it in the same table just to save some space and time. Okay, so you now have x or, right? If you look at x or, x or is 0, 1, 1, 0. Here's a problem because we already see right there that you need two thresholds, right? Because here's a class change here and there's a class change again here. And now thresholding for zero or for one would work, but you also need the threshold here, right? And what you then do is basically you say, okay, well, I guess my first threshold looks like this, x1, x2, right? And the first threshold, again, the these are one, becomes um, uh, basically zero. And then you connect again another new one. And then the threshold becomes one. And then you have to think about how to do the upper one. And you'll do that at another point, okay? But we have already sort of the idea of an algorithm of how to basically, instead of tuning weights, you set the weights to one and you just grow the middle layer, bum, 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 bum. And in doing so, we actually have an estimate of how many neurons in the middle layer we need. It's the worst case. Why is it the worst case? It's the worst case because it's a dumb network. It didn't even train the weights. So what we trade off is we say, let's add a lot of neurons into the middle layer but keep the weights at one, and then our training becomes so much easier. Now, the question becomes, if I do actual training where I try to tune weights, can I use less neurons? Absolutely. Now, the only question is, how many less neurons? Like, like how many less neurons? Well, it turns out um, the expected reduction is exponential. Why? Because it takes this exponential time. You know the backpropagation is NP-complete. It takes this exponential time to create, uh, to, actually, to actually build a network, that, and train a network completely. So we should, with exponential time, expect that we also get exponential reductions in the thresholds. And the one way is to say it like I just said it, and the other way is to just go with Shannon. And Shannon says, well, your alphabet here is like sort of n separations should be log to n, right? And so uh, we get to the point where, aha, uh -huh, we just grow a middle layer and then we figure out log to n, right? And so the algorithm that's depicted in here is exactly doing that, which is basically doing, you grow a middle layer, 
Uh, sorry, I need to switch. Can you share the screen? Uh, right. So the iron that's depicted in here um, is exactly doing that. So the idea is, again, we built some neural network that does the trick. And then we ask ourselves, uh, by using the weights equals one. And then we ask ourselves, as we add weights, um, as we train the weights, instead of just keeping them at one, how much could we save? And it turns out it's with exponential runtime, you could do log two or Shannon will tell you the same thing. And this is the actual algorithm. And you should have questions about that um, because there's a couple more things in here. For example, what would happen if there was a conflict, right? What if two, what are the sum of the, of, the, of the columns actually gives you the same number, but there are two classes associated with it? Well, then we just say, well, the algorithm will figure it out eventually. Let's just add another new one, okay? Um, but and the interesting part is this is basically building a dumb network, a learning restricted network, right? Because the weights can't be trained, it's learning restricted. And using that dumb network is super efficient. You, you basically have a highly efficient uh, estimate of how many neurons, but there could be hash collisions, as I said. Um, um, but we can assume the training and weights and biases gets us 100% accuracy by reducing parameters. And with that assumption, you can now see, okay, we have two values. One is the worst case capacity, which is just building that network stupidly. And the other one is the, what I call expected capacity requirement. The expected capacity requirement would be the log two of that dumb network. And that's the two values you see in uh, the TF meter demo. You see the overfit guarantee, right? With a dumb network. And you see the, the expected, which is 12 bits, okay? Uh, which is the lock of that stupid network. At the same time, um, obviously, I don't want you to uh, completely believe me. There's a paper on it where we tried it on a bunch of data, even on 2,000 images on ImageNet. And uh, these 2,000 images on ImageNet, we were off by 13 bits, <laughs> you know? So that was something. Um, and all of these results, are online in a GitHub, and you can use the tools and try them out and use them on your own data, use them on the data for your project and just work with them. And as you start working with them, I will probably next week or the week after give you an account into our brain home, uh, into our brain home system, which gives you all of these measurements and a lot more and a lot more detailed um, and a lot more accurate than the open source tools um, that, that they are available for you. Um, the only problem is that I cannot give you all the details about how these non-open source tools work. But um, there's a whole repertoire of open source tools on the GitHub that is there for you to try these things out. And I think we leave it there for now. Um, and we will talk about generalization the next time. Because right now, all we were doing was figuring out, okay, what's the worst case for normalization? And then of course, what you do later on, so by basically building a hash table of neurons to figure out more memorization. And then what we do later on is we'll see, okay, how do we get that from memorization to generalization? And that'll be next lecture. Um, but for now, I think uh, we covered a bunch of stuff. Um, I will definitely just shut up and ask you for questions. Um, any questions? Oh, and while I do that, by the way, for the right, I'm just gonna um, kill the recording. So.